Thank you. A very kind uh, introduction. And, and welcome to all of you. Um, uh, I've done a lot of teaching, so I, I like the kind of seminar approach to this. So uh, hopefully you'll have a couple of questions uh, when I uh, finish talking. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, just listening to myself talk you know, can get kind of boring. And I'm a lot older than most of you, so it really gets boring. Um, but um, I'm very honored to be here tonight to uh, be asked by the Clinton uh, School to, to share some of my work with you and some of my experience. And, and um, the focal point of it is a book I, I, I wrote um, and that was published just last year. Uh, it's called The Forgotten Flight. I didn't make up that name, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, but the reason I wrote this book is because nobody in this room, or basically no one I ever talked to about it, knew about this terrorist attack. A jumbo jet that killed 170 people that was supposed to fly to Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. And it was only nine months after the Pan Am 103 flight, which took off from London Heathrow on its way to JFK, New York, blew up over a little sleepy town called Lockerbie, Scotland. And how many of you remember the word Lockerbie and what that means? Yeah, you see? Now, the young people may not, but before 9-11, Lockerbie was pretty much the shorthand word for international terrorism. A jumbo jet, a 747, um, sadly carrying a lot of American college students who were returning home before Christmas uh, after a semester abroad in Europe, um, were killed on that uh, flight. And um, a suitcase bomb had been placed in the hold of the plane, and that bomb went off. The uh, plane shattered into a lot of pieces, and uh, the people who had put the bomb there, which was the Libyan government, Gaddafi, um, they had hoped the plane would crash over the Atlantic Ocean, which would have made it, at that time, almost impossible to find the wreckage and figure out forensically who was responsible for it. Um, nine months after Lockerbie, which the whole world knew about, um, UTA Flight 772, uh, took off from Brazzaville, Congo. That's little Congo, not big Congo, as I hear. And it landed in Nijamina, Chad, uh, to pick up some passengers, including the wife of the U.S. ambassador to Chad. And in a small world that I live in in Washington, years later, I worked with the ambassador because he had been the deputy ambassador in Beirut, Lebanon, in 1983 when the embassy was attacked by Hezbollah and Iran, and I also am handling that case. So he was a witness for me in that case before I really found out that his wife had been killed in a terrorist attack in Africa. It's terrible. Anyway, UTA 772, when it blew up over the Tenere Desert, which is part of the Sahara, was flying at over 30,000 feet. It was a DC-10 wide-body jet, a jumbo jet. Had 170 people on it. It blew up in the sky, broke into four pieces, and um, crashed over a 40 square mile area of one of the most remote places in the world. Not a blade of grass, not a village for 400 kilometers, not a tree, not a, a gum wrapper, not a discarded Coke can, not a cigarette butt, literally nothing but sand, and this wreckage, which by the way, is still today sitting in the desert. To this day, there's some photographs of it in my book, you'll see, if, if you're kind enough to look at it. After the plane crashed, the president of France said, this is extraordinary, we have to find out who's responsible for this. It was a French company, although the plane was owned by an American company which leased it to UTA. That's very common in the international airline business. Very few airlines actually own their planes. They lease them. And, um, uh, a man by the name of Doug Matthews, who had been a yeah, Annapolis grad, a Navy fighter pilot during Vietnam, and then a Delta captain, and then finally a, the third largest aircraft leasing company in the world. This was one of his planes that blew up. So he got very involved in September 1989 when he was sitting in London negotiating some jets that he was going to lease to, um, to British Air and found out one of his planes had gone down with 170 people. So he was very quickly involved in the French criminal investigation and tracking it, but you didn't hear about it here. All you heard about was Lockerbie and what the FBI and Scotland Yard were doing. They were on very different tracks, and one of the real heroes of the story 
and I use that word uh, with great hesitation, but with respect here, was Magistrate Judge John Louis Bruguer, who was the leading investigating magistrate. He's not really a judge, although they call him a judge. He's the investigator. And he was the leading terrorism investigator in France. And the president of France said, Judge Bruguer, you must find out who was responsible for this. This is still, to this day, the biggest terrorist attack in French history, to this day. And you don't even know about it. And so Judge Bruguer took a military plane down to Africa. There's no roads to the site, by the way, where the plane wreckage still sits. You have to fly in with paratroopers or helicopters. And eventually, uh, they, they found the wreckage the next day, by the way, which I describe in the book, when French paratroopers in the Foreign Legion parachuted into the desert and saw for 40 square miles, and you'll see some pictures of this in the book, the wreckage scattered all over, and sadly with 170 uh, dead human beings, many of whom were still strapped in their seats, burned beyond recognition. And so Judge Bruguer made a decision when he made it out to the site about a week later that he was going to try to reassemble the baggage hold of this giant jet. Now, many of you probably don't understand this, but the baggage hold of a jumbo jet is about 40 feet long and 15 feet wide and about 30 feet wide. And trying to locate that over 40 square miles of one of the most inhospitable, unapproachable places on the planet is no easy task. But he decided, we're going to try and figure out what was in that baggage hold. Why? Because they found a small little piece of Samsonite luggage that had pentrite, which is a plastic explosive, right on it. So clearly, they knew from day one this was a bomb with plastic explosive, and they had to figure out who put that suitcase on the plane. And if they could figure that out, then they'd know who to go after. And so Judge Bruguer then started what I characterize, and I believe this, I was a federal prosecutor for seven years, so I know a little about this. This is the greatest detective story in the history of mankind. It is unbelievable. What he did is he brought in hundreds of French foreign legionnaires. There are outposts all through Central uh, Africa. You know, the guys with the, with the round hats and the little curtain on the back, like out of the old movies, and they had little nets and they would cordon off squares. And for days and weeks and months and several years, they went through the sand and pulled out anything that was metal, anything. Because there's nothing there. There isn't even grass, there isn't even trees. So if it's there, it had to come from the plane. And after several years of this, and just imagine 50 or 100 foreign legionnaires all had to look down the whole time shoulder to shoulder, walking through the sand, sifting it, and then having the aerospace engineers try and figure out if that came from the baggage hold. Not just the suitcases themselves, but the superstructure of the baggage hold. And eventually Judge Bruguier and his team reassembled in Paris at a hangar outside the city the luggage area of this plane. An unbelievable project, but he did it. Then they tried to figure out, okay, where was the bomb in the luggage hold? And they could figure that out because forensics can tell you by blast technology and blast analysis where the force of the blast came from. It's a fairly sophisticated and very advanced uh, detective and military technique. And one of the things they found was a small little piece of circuit board about the size of the nail on my thumb, literally that small and it was bent and twisted and burnt. And the forensic said, this was literally next to the bomb. So it's very important evidence. There's no bomb, you can't find the bomb, it exploded, obviously. But here's a circuit board, and it had just a bent twist on it, but the French aerospace engineers could not figure out where does this circuit board fit in the plane? This is a plane with like miles of wires and hydraulics and all kinds of stuff. So the French had to swallow their pride and come to the United States, and they eventually worked with the FBI, because the FBI has still, and then, the best forensic, particularly for explosives, the best forensic lab in the world. And the FBI confirmed that this circuit board had to have been 
literally attached to the bomb because of the way the twist and burn and all that, which the technical aspects I won't get into. But the FBI didn't know where the circuit board fit in the plane, and neither could Judge Berger figure it out. So they went out to Southern California where McDonnell Douglas, now part of Boeing, but McDonnell Douglas had made the plane. It was a DC-10 jumbo jet. And they went out there and they said, look, with the FBI in tow, and they said, we can't figure out where this circuit board, which clearly was next to the bomb, where it fits in your airplane. They said, well, that's because it's not from our airplane. And they said, look, it has to be from your airplane. There's nothing out there. They said, listen, we're telling you, this is not from our airplane. And that's when Bruguer and his team knew they had the, the critical forensic proof to try and figure out who put the bomb on the plane. And then I tell the story in the book, there were two very faded initials on the back of the circuit board, YP. Could be from anywhere, right? And remember, we're talking about the pre-internet, pre-Google world. This is foreign to you guys. You couldn't just sit down on your phone or a laptop and start looking at, no, you had to like do the work. You had to go out and find it. And they spent several years and they eventually found a tiny little shop in Taiwan that wasn't much bigger than a couple of the tables in this room. And they went there and they said, we're trying to figure out, did you, did you make this circuit board? And they looked at it and said, yeah, that's ours. Wow. No computer records, they just found out. But where did you, do? well, we made them in that time frame of 1989. Were you making these boards? Yeah, we were making them. We only made, you know, maybe 100. It's not a big product. Well, who'd you sell them to? Well, we sold them to a company down the street. They assemble these into a bigger product. We just make the component of the circuit board. So they go down to that place. I'm, of course, accelerating the story. And um, they said, did you buy these circuit boards from that guy? Yeah, we did. Well, what'd you do? Well, we put them in these, these little things about a foot wide. And wh what kind of machine is it? Oh, it's a timer. A timer. They found where the timers are made. The timer for a bomb. Now, they don't make them for bombs, but it's a timer. And then they said, well, where did you send these? Well, we sent these to our parent company in Germany. They market them around the world. So they go to Germany. Again, of course, I'm fast forwarding the story with the German authorities. And they go to the company and say, yes, well, we did that, but we give them to another company, another part of Germany, and they actually sell them. So they go to this other company. Again, I'm fast forwarding the story. And they go to this company, no computer records, remember, okay? This is in the 90s. And they said, we're trying to figure out if you had some of these timers in 1989 and who'd you sell them to? And they said, well, we're not sure, but we'll check. The Germans, they keep good records. Germans, very good record keepers. And he went in the back and he pulled out a file. He said, yeah, oh yeah. We sold 100 of these about four months uh, before this bombing. Who'd you sell them to? The Libyan Aviation Service which the French intelligence agents knew was a cover for Libyan intelligence services that report directly to Gaddafi. And then they showed them some photographs. Well, did you go to Libya to sell? Oh yeah, we went down there, we met with them. You know, Libya wasn't on any prohibited list at the time, it was legal. Did you meet this guy? They showed him a picture of head of intelligence. Oh yeah, we met him. Did you see this guy? Oh yeah, we met him. So now they're connecting it directly with Libyan intelligence at the highest levels. And then to close the deal, they said, how did they pay for these timers? Oh, by cashier's check from a bank. How do you know that? We have a copy of it here in our file. A canceled check from the terrorist state for the timer that set off the bomb. Now, this was over a number of years, mind you and was an extraordinary detective story. And I tell it in the book because it's a story that nobody knows about. And it's the most remarkable detective story you'll ever hear in your life. And by the way, on the Pan Am Lockerbie uh, disaster, they never found evidence at this level, not even close. Not, I mean, that's always been the controversy. Libya set off the bomb, I'm confident of that. But they never were able to prove it at that level. So. The French criminal case, the greatest detective story in history, is how this starts out. Because I want people to know about that. Over time, you'll see the book is divided into two parts. 
The first part, I'm not involved in. That's the French criminal case, uh, what you might call legal proceedings in France, although uh, President Jacques Chirac basically sold out all the French victims and did a deal with Gaddafi so that the French oil companies could go into Libya before the Americans and the Brits. That's why the subtitle of this book is Terrorism, Diplomacy, and the Pursuit of Justice, or as I can tell you now, how those things are not always done consistently. And um, I also tell in the first part of the book about the United Nations Security Council in New York and how the US and the Brits and the French put a lot of pressure on Gaddafi in Libya by using the UN Security Council to impose a lot of sanctions that eventually pushed Gaddafi into the bargaining table. And he did a lot of deals, which I won't bore you with, I'll let you read the book. But clearly, the UN, and this was under Bush Sr. Uh, there's three presidents really involved here, Bush Sr., President Clinton, and Bush W. Um, but Bush Sr., who had been the UN ambassador for the US, believed in diplomacy. You know, he, he believed in using the UN, and, and to great effect. And that was the first step in putting some pressure on Gaddafi. Um, the book also talks about how pretty much right before I got involved, Gaddafi thought he'd gotten away with it. He thought he had fixed all his problems. He thought he was no longer going to be a pariah. But as the first part of the book ends, um, that was when uh, Doug Matthews approached me through his lawyer in Florida and said, you know, we've been tracking all these things in, in France that's going on and all the diplomacy. We want to file a lawsuit against Libya and Washington in federal court. Can we do that? I said, yeah, maybe, let's talk about it. And he had heard about my work representing people who uh, had been victims of terrorism. Um, I tell briefly in the book part of how I got into this. Uh, one of my very first clients had been a uh, journalist. He was the chief correspondent for the Associated Press in the Middle East. And when he was in Beirut, Lebanon in the mid 80s, he was taken hostage by Hezbollah in Iran and was held for seven years. His name was Terry Anderson. Some of you may remember that. And I represented Terry first, when he was released, first on some pro bono matters to get our own government to cough up information about his captivity. And then in 1996, when President Clinton, apropos of where we are now, signed a law, the terrorism exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, that for the first time allowed Americans who'd been victims of terrorism and could prove that a country that was on the list of state sponsors of terrorism that the State Department keeps, at that time there were like eight countries on the list. Iraq, Iran, Syria, Yemen, North Korea, Libya, Cuba, and one or two others, um, then you could sue them in court. And so after 1996, when President Clinton signed that law, there weren't that many cases filed actually. And Terry's was, he asked me, hey, Stu, you want to do this? I said, yeah, sure, why not? And so we did. Now, Iran didn't show up. They default on these cases. They do show up, by the way, when you're going after their money. They just don't show up at the beginning. Um, but because of my work on Terry Anderson's case, we eventually got a judgment for Terry and his family. Um, again, right at the end of President Clinton's term, uh, President Clinton signed legislation that allowed us to... Uh, tap into some Iranian assets to pay Terry's uh, judgment and a few others that we were handling, but it was just a handful. Not like today where there's like 200 of these cases going around and they're all over the place, and I, I do a lot of those, by the way. And so because I had handled that case and because the Washington Post had done a big front page story about it and how we had successfully recovered money for Terry, uh, Doug Matthews called me and said, I want to come see you. And that's how I got involved in the UTA case. And the first thing that Doug and I did was to figure out there were seven American families who were, seven Americans who were killed on the flight. And um, my firm, which is one of the big firms in DC, we don't like advertise on late night TV. Uh, you know, if you got a phone, you got a lawyer, you've seen a few of those ads late at night. You know, with the sirens going off behind you and a guy in a, we don't, we don't do that, no. Uh, and if I wanted to, my firm wouldn't let me. Um, but we don't do that. But I said to Doug, if you can go contact these seven families and tell them what you have in mind and you guys work it out, we'll represent everybody. 
And that's what we did. And Doug organized it and uh, managed it. And, and Doug, who you should understand, was a very wealthy man, uh, highly educated, worldly. He was on the you know, you know, US polo team. I mean, this is a guy who played polo with Prince Charles. This was a very, he didn't need this, but he had a strong sense of justice. And he wanted to hold Libya accountable in a court of law. And, and he's also one of the heroes of the book. And I, and I say that, both Judge Bruguier and, and Doug Matthews really are heroes. Um, and there's one or two others you'll read about. And so um, we started the case, and the first thing we did after the family sign up is Doug and I flew over to Paris. I'd been going to Paris a lot on other business, and we were able to meet Judge Bruguier. Nobody meets Judge Bruguier. This is like in a James Bond movie. I mean, you just don't meet Judge Bruguier. People have tried to kill him. You know, he has armed guards all the time. His nickname is Le Sheriff. Interesting guy. And uh, he's a good friend. I just had dinner with him last summer when he was in DC. And um, we went up to his office and I tell the story in the book. And Doug, through some intelligence friends he had, um, arranged for this. And we sat down in Bruguer's office and he started talking about the case and we really didn't know much about it. There wasn't any public information. Even the criminal proceedings in France, you don't have access to. It's not like here in the States where anything in court, anybody can go look at, no. And so he started talking about the UTA case. And this was you know, years later. This is now in 2001. So this is 12 years after the bombing, but long after he and his team had solved it and proven Libya was behind it. And right after, not shortly uh, before we got there, President Chirac had cut a deal with Gaddafi and stopped the prosecution of Libyans who were charged with murder and stopped Bruguer's investigation. And Bruguer was pretty pissed off. And so were a lot of the professionals in France who had done the investigation and the diplomacy because they saw their own president selling out their own people just so France could get more oil more quickly from Gaddafi. That's the diplomacy part of the story. And so Bruguer started talking about the UTA and started telling us the story about this little circuit board in the desert. And we're sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm a Washington lawyer who's kind of in this world, right? Former prosecutor, I do terrorism cases. I had no idea what he was talking about. Nobody, this story had never been told, ever. And I'm like, oh, wow, I gotta get these files. But he couldn't give them to us. But in France, under their system, victims can participate in a criminal prosecution, formally. We don't have that in our country. The US attorney or the local district attorney handles it, not the victims. But in France, the victims are part of the criminal prosecution. And the French victim organization, which had its headquarters at the uh, Les Invalides, uh, the beautiful gold dome, a place where Napoleon's buried, right in, on the left bank, they invited me over with Bruguer telling them it was okay. And they let me copy all of the files in the criminal case. 33 volumes in French, including all the forensic files, Bruguer's reports, everything. Now my firm has an office in Brussels with French speakers. So I got on the phone, I said, you get down here tonight and you get me a vendor who can come in here and copy every piece of paper in this room because we're not allowed to take it out of here. And it took them two days and they copied everything. And then we took it all back to DC on a DVD and I had my Brussels office associates come over who speak French fluently and went through every piece of paper and translated the ones we would need for the US case. So now we have all of the evidence that Bruguer had collected that proved conclusively that Libya had carried out the bombing. And so we sued Libya under the 96 law that President Clinton had signed on behalf of the company that owned the plane, Doug's company, Interlease, and the seven Americans and their families who were killed. And um, small world that I live in in Washington, the US ambassador to Chad, Robert Pugh, a career ambassador, his wife had gotten on the plane to fly home for their daughter's wedding in Charlottesville, Virginia. She never made it, of course. And several years later, I'm handling the case involving the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon. Bob Pugh was the deputy ambassador, the deputy chief of mission in that bombing. He was already a witness for me in that case. 
when Doug Matthews hired me. And I had heard from someone, oh yes, his wife had been killed in a plane accident, or, but I had no idea it was UTA. And so you talk about a small world. This is the world I live in in Washington. And so we called the case Pew versus Libya. And Libya defended the case, raising every procedural and jurisdictional defense they possibly could because they wanted delay. And the other part of what we did was working with the US uh, State Department, particularly under George W. Bush and Condi Rice, who was the Secretary of State. I had some friends at the State Department because when I had worked in the US Attorney's Office, I was the State Department's lawyer in court in Washington and in the DC Circuit. So I kind of knew my way around there a little bit. And so they, they helped us a bit and they actually helped us for the first and I think last time prove in court in Washington that Libya had carried out the bombing. We then had, uh, and I'm skipping through a lot of the things in the book, of course, we eventually had a trial on the damages that the judge should award for the families against Libya. And this is a part of the book that you really have to brace yourself for. Um, I don't care if you're a military veteran, a police officer, I don't care. You're gonna have to stop and catch your breath and maybe wipe away a few tears when you read that part of the case. The judge cried. The courtroom personnel cried. Not just because of the stories that the families were telling in court about the people they'd lost, a father, a husband, a daughter, which were horrific. But I also had to bring in some experts, um, flight surgeons, aviation experts. Why? Because I had to prove to this federal judge, Judge Henry Kennedy, another hero in the book, <coughs> that um, our clients were entitled to a very large amount of damages from Libya, an oil producing state after all, for carrying out mass murder by blowing up this plane. And none of the families had ever heard any of this testimony before. None of the families knew each other until they came to Washington for the trial in the summer of 2007. One was a geologist for Exxon, a young girl who was in the Peace Corps, uh, a guy who was a um, oil rig worker. I mean, these are the people that go to the Sahara Desert. I mean, who else goes there? It's not exactly for tourists. And so they didn't know each other before they came there. Only Doug Matthews had connected them. And they told their horrific stories of their loss. And then they heard these experts describe how the plane blew up in pieces at 35,000 feet. How what happens to people on a plane at 35,000 feet? Everyone here has been on a jet plane, but you have no idea what happens if the integrity of the plane is broken at 35,000 feet. The plane depressurizes. The gases in your body explode. The jet fuel explodes into flames. You're traveling at 400 miles an hour. It's like being in the inside of a tornado all at once. And the worst part is most of the people don't die immediately. It took 90 seconds for this plane to hit the sand in the desert. 90 seconds of people experiencing that. And when Judge Kennedy heard this testimony, he just, he just couldn't believe it. He had never heard anything like this. This is a very experienced federal judge in Washington who thought he had heard everything. And he later made his damages award based in part on every second that someone may have been alive and the terror and the pain and the fear that they experienced, knowing they were going to die. But it took three minutes, oh no, a minute and a half for it to happen. So brace yourself if you read the book for the trial near the end because it's it's a terrible story, but as the lawyer, it was my job and my team's job to put on the best case we could. And we got from Judge Kennedy an extraordinary damage award, um, really extraordinary. And that's where the diplomacy kicked in again. Because it was at the very end of George W. Bush's time in office. The fight, the war on terror, wasn't going very well in Afghanistan or Iraq. And Libya presented an opportunity for him to declare some victories before he left office. 
Gaddafi had handed over his nuclear stuff. Okay, that was a pretty big deal. He was cooperating with the CIA and the Pentagon to go after Al-Qaeda because Al-Qaeda was trying to kill Gaddafi. And other things. Most importantly, the U.S. oil companies wanted to go back into Libya. And George W. Bush and Vice President uh, Dick Cheney were, as you know, very good friends with the oil companies. And so everybody said, we got to wrap this up. And so when we got our judgment, and Gaddafi freaked out that I got such a big judgment, we know this from WikiLeaks, okay? We've seen the cables from the U.S. mission in Tripoli back to Washington. That's when Judge, uh, President Bush said, okay, we're not going to help these people anymore. We got to wrap this up. And I'm not going to get into the details of how that happened, but the President of the United States and the Congress and the federal courts all worked together quickly to stop my case in its tracks. But it took the President of the United States, the entire Congress, and the federal courts to do it, which tells you what I was up against, plus Gaddafi and Libya. And so people have asked me many times, well, how'd you feel about all this? Well, um, my clients did get a fair amount of money under the settlement. Bush did a settlement with Gaddafi, with Gaddafi because of our case. And, and, and they, they were well compensated. I'm not gonna stand here and complain that we didn't get more money. They got a fraction of the judgment that I obtained. A fraction, 5% of the, of the judgment, literally. And so Gaddafi, quote, got away with it. He was able to pay a lot less than the federal court had determined our clients were entitled to. But, you know, if I got too bitter about these things, I, I couldn't do my job, and I have a lot of these cases. So one of the things that, and, and I'll try and kind of direct the discussion now, to, you know, well, what, what did your clients and you get out of this other than some money? Well, let me describe to you some of the good things, and I, and I talk about this in the, in the end. Um, people who've lost a loved one in a terrorist attack, particularly one overseas, particularly one where it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's not on TV. It, they've never been there. They don't know where it is. For them to come to a court, a federal court in Washington, D.C. And these people were from Texas, Oklahoma, Ohio. I mean, these, these were not, you know, big city slickers. And they come to Washington and, you know, with my firm handling it, and to go to a federal court in Washington and tell their story to a federal judge with a lawyer from Libya sitting there, just like you're sitting right here, and talk about the loss and talk about the pain and talk about how lives were radically changed in many ways, gave them a sense of psychological closure that they had never had up until that time. Remember, from September of 1989 till the summer of 2007, that's what, 18 years? They had been living with this. Lives had been destroyed, families destroyed, okay? Kids killed. And they all, to a person, afterwards, it was almost like a catharsis, a cathartic experience for them to go through that process. And I had seen this many, many times before with other people I had represented. I had told them they might feel this way, but I couldn't guarantee it. And a lot of them said, even if we never get a dollar, I feel different now than I did before. I feel like I have now gotten some closure that I thought I would never get in my life. So that alone, is very gratifying. They also um, talked about being able to look someone in the aisle. Now, the lawyer, of course, had nothing to do with the bombing, but he's there on behalf of Libya. And to, to look at somebody in the eye and say, your client did this and we're gonna hold them accountable. That was very meaningful to them. And that's something that a lot of my clients in these terrorism cases have found to be particularly helpful in a process um, I think it actually has helped some of them with a lot of very serious uh, post-traumatic stress and psychological problems that they had, like in a serious way. And they've told me that. And professionals, psychiatrists and psychologists, have told me that this is one of the few ways they've ever seen people who've gone through that kind of trauma actually get on a path to recovery. So that's a fascinating thing to know. And then there's also this issue that I deal with a lot which is this intersection between just being an advocate for clients and a case, although they're kind of unique, of course, and what's best for the United States in the world. 
Should we make peace with countries like Libya? Should we make peace with countries that blow up embassies, blow up airplanes, uh, carry out political assassinations? Or should we just, you know, kill them and bomb them? Uh, you know, and if the President of the United States and the Congress think that it's in the interest of the U.S. to try and work something out, and so long as they don't forget about our people and we're included in some kind of resolution, I can probably go along with it. I'm leaving out a lot of the details, of course. Um, I'm in the middle now of a case against Sudan. In August of 1998, I use this by way of example, um, two Al-Qaeda truck bombers drove into our embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. These are the East African embassy bombings. Most of you have probably heard of those. Um, Nairobi was particularly bad because it was in a downtown building, a high-rise glass office building. I represent all the Americans who were killed in that bombing. Horrific, just horrific. Um, at that time, if you know the geography of East Africa, Sudan borders on Kenya and Tanzania. And Sudan then and now was on the list of sponsors of terrorism at the State Department. In fact, the president, Bashir, president for the last 30 years, is an indicted war criminal. And he was providing safe harbor to Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden at the time that the embassy bombings were planned and carried out. So we could sue Sudan for supporting Al Qaeda, and we did. We got a big judgment. It was affirmed in the Court of Appeals. It's up in the Supreme Court now. But there's a lot of uh, diplomacy and politics going on with Sudan. Both President Obama and President Trump have lifted the sanctions on Sudan because Sudan appears to be doing the right things. Cooperating on intelligence, throwing out Iran, working with the Saudis, uh, the Israelis don't have to bomb convoys anymore, that sort of thing. And um, so you might be reading pretty soon about something happening with Sudan, but we have a huge judgment against Sudan and um, it's up in front of the Supreme Court now. Uh, but those are the kind of cases where, again, working not just in the courtroom, but outside the courtroom with the State Department and other diplomatic angles um, is a part of my job to try and both get justice for our clients, but also understand that the President and the Secretary of State and the CIA and the Congress, they may care about my clients, particularly because they worked at the embassy, but they also care about the government's foreign policy. And sometimes these things match up and sometimes they conflict. And that's why my job can be very difficult sometimes when they conflict. And if you don't have a really good idea how things work in DC, um, you're not gonna really be able to help your clients very much, which sadly is why a lot of people hire me in my firm because we unfortunately have this experience. So um, I've been talking for almost 45 minutes and I'd like to wrap it up and maybe there'll be a few questions. Um, I'd like to finish by talking about the book. Um, I'm not a, an author, I'm a lawyer, okay? I, I'm a lawyer. But I decided that this story had to be told because nobody knew about it. Nobody. Even people in my firm, unless they worked on it with me, they didn't know about it. And so I started a process after the settlement, after we had sorted out all the claims issues, uh, maybe about six, seven years ago, maybe a little more, I started outlining the story. I'm like, I, I know I can do a book about this. There's a book here. I mean, all lawyers think they can write books. Very few of them write them, and even fewer get them published, believe me. Um, lawyers have very big egos, as you know. Well, shocker, right? Um, and so I outlined it, and then I started filling it in and doing a little more research, and you know, bits and pieces here and there. I'd work on it. And then I'd drop it for six months because I was in a big trial in Paris at the World Bank or I'd do whatever. Then I'd work on it for another month. And, you know, I had other stuff going on. Busy guy, family, you know, got a life. Managed to break my leg in the middle of that skiing and a few other things, some health issues. But eventually the book took shape. And I kind of worked on it very part time and very much on my own. Didn't even tell my firm I was working on it till I was done and I had a book contract. I didn't want them to get nervous about it. Lawyers can be real sticklers about this stuff, particularly at big firms. So um, I waited till I had a book contract and it was done. Then I told them, oh, what did you do, Stu? Oh, it's too late. I already have a book contract. So there's nothing you can do about it. Um, lawyer trick. So um, the book was written because I wanted people to know the story. 
about the criminal case that the French did, extraordinary, about my own role going against Libya. It's not written for lawyers, by the way. It's written for non-lawyers. Um, and my publisher in London is a very respected independent publisher. They've won a few Booker Prizes. Uh, they weren't going to publish a law book or a lawyer type book. It's very readable. You can read this in a couple of sittings. It's very fast. Um, it has some fascinating photographs that I was able to find, some of which people had never seen before. Pictures of the wreckage still there in the desert today and some of the main characters. Um, I called it the Forgotten Flight, which I thought was the perfect name because that's what the BBC called it about 10, 11 years ago. And I said, that's it, that's the name. Gotta be, it's the free, it, this is the forgotten flight. And I want it to never be forgotten again. And that's why I wrote this book, and if you're kind enough to read it, I would love to hear your comments on it. Uh, maybe write a review in Amazon or one of those things about it. Be cruel, I'm not here soliciting good reviews. I just wanna know what people think. And um, you can, I know they're going to sell some of them here. Happy to sign it for you if you like. Um, I'm not giving up my day job. I'm not a, an author. Okay? I'm just a lawyer who wrote a book. Um, but I think you'd find it very interesting. And I think you'd find it uh, enlightening about a topic that unfortunately we're all becoming all too familiar with on a daily basis, which is terrorism and terror in all the forms it comes in. And this is a piece of it that I think everyone should know about. Gotten good reviews, the Wall Street Journal, Publishers Weekly, Jerusalem Post. I mean, you know, it's gotten around. Um, so please let me know what you think if you're kind enough to read it. Uh, send me an email, write a review, whatever you want to do. But what I thought I'd do, since we have a couple of minutes left, is if anyone has any questions about either the book or about the underlying story, um, happy to take them. Hopefully I can answer them, and we'll take it from there. Do you want to be in charge yeah, of that? Yeah, we're going to start right here. Brenda, okay, that's fine. What did Gaddafi or the Libyan government have to gain by blowing up this airliner? Ah, this particular one, as best as we can tell, and after Gaddafi fell, some of his thugs actually admitted to this. Um, <clears throat> the border between Libya and um, Niger, it's a desert. Back in 1986 or 87, there was a discovery on the Chad side of the border of a huge uranium deposit. Yeesh, uranium. You don't want to hear the word Qaddafi and uranium in the same sentence. Qaddafi invaded Chad because he wanted the uranium field. Remember, he was working to develop nuclear weapons. Wouldn't it be nice to have your own uranium? The Chadians, who were no match for Libya, asked the French, former French colony, and France has a relationship with its former colonies, to come in and defend them. And so the French basically came in and kicked his butt, got him thrown out of Chad, and Gaddafi was furious, absolutely furious, at the French for depriving him of what he thought he wanted, which was the uranium. And so, let's blow up a French airplane and kill a lot of French people. That's how that murderous thug thought. That's the short answer. There's right a longer in. answer, but that gives you the details. Um, thank you. This is really, truly fascinating. Um, I'm curious, how do you get um, these countries to show up um, in, in mm. court? You mentioned sort of when the money comes in, but even then, if you could talk a little bit about Libya and like how did they, the settlement that you ended up not getting the whole thing, but a part of it, where did this sort of come from? Where was it unlocked? And um, how, do you, how do you get their lawyers to show up? Well, I don't get them to, to show up. The government on the other side has to make a decision. So it's political and legal. Now, some of these countries have made political decisions that they will defend these cases because it can delay things, they can take appeals, they can drag it out and until they can work it out. Gaddafi decided that he was going to hire lawyers to defend these because he had already been working hard on the diplomatic front to work things out, to, to remove his pariah status. This was just another element of that, a very visible one. And so that's why he did that. Sudan, uh, who I'm engaged in now, uh, you know, for uh, basically protecting Al Qaeda when they blew up our embassies in East Africa. They've hired White and Case, one of the biggest law firms in the world. Okay, and White and Case defends Sudan in these cases. Okay, fine. You know, it's a living. Everybody's entitled to a lawyer in our country, even the bad guys, even the guilty. That's our system. 
White and Case makes millions of dollars from it, so they're okay. And so they decide, not me. I love when they show up. You always want the other side to be represented. At the end of the day, you are more likely to sort things out than not. Iran doesn't show up, ever. There's a hundred judgments against Iran. I have a lot of them. They only show up when you find some of their money, and then they hire the best lawyers in the country and go all the way to the Supreme Court. So that's, that's their deal. Other questions? Right there. My question was along the, the same line as hers, but so what, what can you do when these countries um, refuse to hand down the judgment that's afforded them? Is, is that kind of what uh, the federal government is, is there to do to uh, create sanctions, new sanctions against that, that country or that state? Well, the short answer is it depends, but that's what all lawyers will tell you. Um, you're asking the question, I'm going to recast your question. How do you enforce these judgments if they don't show up? That's what you're really asking. Everybody asks that question. That's the first question everybody wants to know, including my partners. Um, how are you going to enforce this judgment? Well, it depends who you're going against. If it's a country like Libya, I'll give you an example. When we were getting towards the end of the case and we got the judgment against Libya, George W. had already taken them off the terrorism list, lifted the sanctions, and U.S. oil companies were signing huge billion-dollar deals with the Libyan oil companies, a Libyan state oil company. I love that. Why? Because when I had a final judgment, which I never got, Bush took it away with Congress. But if I had a final judgment, I could go to those oil companies and say, you have a billion-dollar contract with Libya, the national oil company. The next payment they make to you goes in my client escrow account. I have an order from the federal court. Thank you. That's one of the reasons that there was a deal with Libya, because I was a direct threat to Exxon and its you know, $10 billion or whatever it was doing with Libya. That's one example. I'll give you a very different example. Um, Iran, which is still number one, okay? They always have been and always will be the number one terrorist state in the world, bar none. Um, we don't have any Iranian assets in this country to speak of. Okay. Some people have found Iranian assets. There was a case in the Supreme Court a couple of years ago where somebody found an account at Citicorp, but it was in Europe, but then the courts had ordered it to be handed over. The Supreme Court of the United States said that the uh, Iranians had to hand over like one and a half billion dollars, mostly for the Marine Barracks folks, the people killed in the October uh, 1983 bombing of the Marine Barracks. And they recovered it. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. It's the Bank Marchese case. You can look it up. I wasn't involved in that case, and I was not involved in the Marine Barracks cases. Two years ago, because I had all these Iran judgments for the embassy bombings that were not being paid, I convinced Congress, bipartisan, worked with Republicans and Democrats on the Judiciary Committees, to set up a fund at the Department of Justice called the Victim Compensation Fund for those people who'd been unable to recover anything, particularly from Iran. But not a dollar of taxpayer money went in that fund. Well, where are you going to get the money? Simple. All the foreign banks and companies that have pled guilty to criminal charges in the U.S. for violating the Iran sanctions program. They've paid billions in criminal fines and forfeitures and penalties. And I convinced Congress to just take a small amount of that, a billion dollars, put it over in this fund, and have a special master sort out anyone who has a final judgment, pro rata, you get a check. And in 2000. This is 2018, right? Yeah. 2017, they made the first payment out of that fund. They paid over a billion dollars. And I have a lot of clients who got a check. Not a dollar from the U.S. government, but only what I call bad guy money. BNP Paribas, one of the world's largest banks, paid seven billion, with a B, seven billion dollars in criminal fines and forfeitures. And one billion of that went into the first payments out of that fund. My clients were very satisfied that someone who was making billions of dollars in profits from Iran by breaking the law and got caught and was prosecuted by the Justice Department and had to plead guilty and pay billions of dollars, they were okay taking that money. That wasn't taxpayer money. That fund is in existence for the next eight years. There's gonna be more payments next year. There was a big Chinese company this year that pled guilty called ZTE, some of you may have read about it. They paid hundreds of millions of dollars in civil fines for violating the Iran sanctions program. Some of that money went in my fund. 
That's very gratifying. So you can see there's very different ways. Libya paid money in a settlement. Iran, people either have found some assets or took it all the way to the Supreme Court, or I got this fund set up. Other solutions, you gotta be creative. You know, there's, there's more than one way to do this. Thank, thank God. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so when you're talking about some of these flights, the forgotten flight and the one in Scotland, of course, I know that there are also several hostage situations with planes throughout the 80s and the 70s, I believe. Um, um, I was born in the 90s under Clinton. Um, I didn't really know much about those flights. Right. Um, do you think that's a problem and why that is, that like people my generation don't really seem to know much about these terroristic acts? Well, look, uh, my kids are all grown. I mean, they're your age. Actually, they're older than you. Um, A lot of history, people either don't have the time or the interest in studying. Um, it's just the way life is. I mean, you know, one of the great, they always say one of the great things about the United States is we're not prisoners of history, like Europe. Um, I mean, some things we are, but mostly we're not. We tend to be a forward thinking people. But you have to study what has happened in the past to learn to be better prepared for the future. My kids know about this because they're sick of hearing me talk about it for the last 20 years, but I say that facetiously. Um, but I wrote this book so that hopefully people will read it in a very approachable way. I don't just talk about this case. I also spend a lot of time in the book talking about the Lockerbie case because it ran in parallel. And, I, and I, I talk about the differences in the criminal cases, in the prosecutions, in the civil cases, in the diplomacy, everything. Um, to this day, a lot of the families on the Pan Am Lockerbie are very unhappy. They never got closure. They never went to court to prove their case. The lawyers cut a deal and that was that. And um, I talk about some of those things in the book. Um, I also talk about other terrorist attacks in the 80s and 90s, some of which I've handled the cases on. And so it's a way to learn about what was going on then. And Politically, um, you know, President Clinton signing that bill in 1996, uh, and also the bill right before he left office that allowed us to get some of the first ones paid, like Terry Anderson. These are really important things that very few people know about, but this is important history. So this book, actually it's characterized as history, not law, uh, uh, by the publisher and like on Amazon. And, um, and that's good, because I want people to learn from it. And I really want them to know about Bruguer's investigation. It's, it's unbelievable. People need to know this. All the crap that's on TV and in the movies that people just make up in Hollywood, this is real. This happened, you know? And everybody's, oh, this make a great movie. I'm not sure I'd want this to be a movie. You know why? Hollywood will just screw it up. You know, it's like, that's okay. Just a book's good. I can control the book. Movie's harder to do. Hope that answers your question. Any, any other? I know we're getting on time. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story. If you do have uh, questions, please come up and, and, and ask him up here. Yeah, come Thanks up you. individually. I'm yeah. happy to talk to you. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure.